Good evening. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. is having a night tonight, so this is just a warning. He's on fire. Um, <laughs> my name is Stacy Wilson Hunt. I'm so honored to be here to bring out three of the amazing actors from this incredible film you just saw. What did you think, by the way? Yeah! <laughs> All right. Let's bring out Robert Downey Jr. Emily Blunt. Such nice people, by the way, really, truly. And Killian Murphy. So, truly extraordinary work. Congratulations. And I remember it was July 11th, and you were in Paris, and you were having the premiere of this film, and you were removed from the building when the, the SAG strike began. All those months later, watching how this film has resonated so deeply in the world, how does it feel to be able to talk about it, but also, what does it mean to you? Let me start with you, Killing. Oh, I mean, it means everything, really, I mean, because it's, uh, you know, it was, it was made for theaters. This is how it was designed to be, to be seen, so it's great to, to be here with an audience watching it again. Yeah, it was very odd. We, it was actually London. We got to Paris, then it was London, then it all, all just stopped. So I've just been at home eating cheese. <laughs> well, you look great for eating cheese Thanks. for four or five months. Thanks. Recommend it. When did you stop eating cheese? Uh, yesterday, actually. Oh, right. <laughs> Yeah. You have great color, great color in your cheeks. And Emily and Robert, for you watching sort of how this took hold over the summer, I mean, I among, you know, I, went, I saw in the theater, people I never thought would go to see a movie like this in the theater were just lined up. It really almost made me weep when I would go to the theater to see this. Was that your reaction to sort of feeling social media and just watching from your corner of the world? Well, Emily is crying most of the day days anyway, so it could be about anything. Which is very, Strange thing to say. Very <laughs> what was your experience? Okay, well, I remember just because we never really got to watch it with an audience and together, you know, which was, it was sad, but so when we got back to New York and the strike was hitting, John and I managed to find uh, one IMAX screen in Nyack, New York, in a shopping mall. school Nyack. <laughs> Guys, who's from Nyack? Um, we found a, a couple of seats in Nyack, New York at 4 p.m. and I saw a group of teenagers walk in dressed as him. Oh, and I remember with pipes dangling, dangling out of their mouths and the hat and I just, I like squeezed John's hand. I was yep. like, oh, it, this is crazy. It was so thrilling. We have all been awestruck by it and continue to be. It's very difficult to put into words what it means to everyone. I love that. And Robert, I don't want to rob you of this moment. Uh, don't cry, because you know you always do. So just don't. <laughs> First of all, Murphy's on, uh, he's on Dublin time. It is so fun when you're well, you, you were exhausted for the whole shoot, but you know. Um, He's again, just missing cheese. That's you're right. It. It, was the, it, was the, it was the same thing of seeing um, folks dress up as Oppie and going to the theater as in a Malibu colony for Halloween. There was a lot of Oppies there. Uh, it was just, it was extraordinary. And I think it gave me a lot of hope in the resurgence, not just of cinema, but we know, you know, we've been through this uh, amazing. Uh, three plus year period, all of us together, and uh, yes. it was just so satisfying. Dude. Magical, really magical. And Killing, this was your sixth film with Chris, Chris Nolan, mm -hmm. which is amazing. And you have posited one of the reasons that he may have trusted you with this role, which is, quote, one of my favorite quotes, that you have resting physicist face. <laughs> <laughs> Which I didn't know was a thing, but now that I'm looking at you, this is making a lot more sense. And obviously you were chosen for more than that. And what most scared and excited you about telling this story? Because I have to imagine it was probably equal measure excitement, but also, wow, the gravitas. 
Um, yes, it was both. Uh, and, and, you know, the way Chris operates, uh, he, he never ever gives you any warning or any preamble. You just get, I was at home eating cheese, and then, uh, the next thing I got, I got a call from Chris, at, like genuinely out of the blue, and he said in his very understated British way, you know, I'm making this film about Oppenheimer, and I'd like you to play Oppenheimer, and then boom, and you know, I had to sit down, and uh, it's, it, it, it's quite a thing, like, and, and genuinely I didn't know, I mean, I had sort of basic level, like, knowledge of, of Oppenheimer and 45, and, Manhattan Project, but kind of nothing after that. So I knew it was a, a big one. And um, so, yeah, but I, yeah, it was terrifying. But I think in, I, I, I kind of love being terrified about work. I think it's important to feel the pressure. It's important to feel like, how the hell can I do this? Uh, um, I think that the gr greatest work comes from that. And it was extremely exciting. Then, you know, he flew to Dublin and I sat in his hotel room and I read the script and, I, and it was genuinely one of the best um, scripts I had ever read. It's written in the first person, which exactly. I find to be an amazing and just very authentic approach. Tell us a little bit about how that changed your read of the script, that it was written through Avi's eyes. Well, I'd never, I'd never read a script that was written like that in the first person, so, you know, it, it's like I walk into the room and I meet grow. All the scene and, direction was really just first person. Everything. Wow. And I think the ambition was was to try and tell the film as subjectively as possible through Oppenheimer's um, eyes, but that immediately then adds to the terror. <laughs> so, um, uh, well, it makes you feel like you're literally carrying the entire story. Yes, but then he went and cast, you know, these guys, the best actors in the bloody world, so, you know, for these other parts. So you feel very kind of safe knowing that you'll be in scenes with these. With these guys, and you've got Christopher Nolan directing it. So, like I and 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 we have this long um, working relationship, and we have a, we have great uh, understanding and a gr and great trust in each other. So, so yeah, you feel kind of uh, secure, but 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 kind of terrified. But that's 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 exactly the feeling you want at the beginning of a project. I think. Absolutely, perfect alchemy. Well, amazing work. It's hard to overstate it, but really, <laughs> truly. Emily, amazing work as well, as always, from you. Um, so this film, obviously, most people know, is based on the sprawling biography, American Prometheus, by two incredible writers, Kai Bird and Sally Martin Sherwin, passed away not too long ago. And I want to credit them, because without their source material, we likely wouldn't be sitting here. And Emily, what was revealed about Kitty in their text? And what openings existed for you as an actor to sort of fill in the spaces that weren't known about her? And how did you balance those two? I mean, she was a um, very colourful character, even in the even in the book. And I mean, I love the wonderful little kind of tidbits about her. And is it tidbit or tidbit? It's, it's technically tid. I've always wondered that. Sort of like, as, as I said it, I was like, was that right? Is it, do you know what it is? It's tid. Tidbit. You can make it your own. We're, I you, think you I can do whatever tidbit, you like. Didn't I? Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Um, <laughs> There were wonderful nuances about her in the book, um, but I really... Great Britain is going to need to get to bed early tonight, okay? <laughs> just, I know it's not great. Don't get him started about what is in Ireland. Um, <laughs> there was one line I remember from the book, and it, one of the uh, scientist's wives said it about her, and they said, Kitty didn't do small talk, she only did big talk. And I really, that one really resonated with me, because you know, in the book, people were not always full of praise for her because she was very difficult and unpredictable and, and not times. conforming to the times. Yes, and a non-conformist, so would throw kind of wonderful cocktail parties, but that was, it was sort of cocktail parties with no food or anything <laughs> else. You know? Very austere cocktail yeah. parties. Lots of cigarettes and lots of vodka. And what did you grow to like the most about her? And did you feel a connected tissue to her as a fellow working woman, professional woman? Um, I think that quiet desperation that she must have felt, I think I just gathered, it gathered speed for me more and more as I empathized more and more with the idea of a really extraordinary brain 
going to waste um, as she tried to contort herself to domesticity, which she was not built for. It wasn't in her nature to be a good housewife or a good mother. And yet it was so sort of shameful to be those things at that time. Um, I think there was like a ferocity of, she just didn't care what anyone thought about her and was completely unfiltered. And I just fell in love with that more than anything. It's yeah. definitely something to admire. Yeah, okay. yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. And Robert, you are a wise man. You say interesting things very often. <laughs> so I know, on. it's amazing. Tidbit. Tidbit. <laughs> And here's a tidbit that you said recently that I really like, which you said, this film is, quote, a meditation on where we go when we are unchecked and that we are hardwired to accumulate power and deadly force as human beings, as scary as that is. A searingly sophisticated quote. Very, I tried to find the one that made you sound the smartest. I like it. By the way, real quick, I want to thank Alex Berliner down here for letting me sleep one off in his back garden in 1991. Thanks. <laughs> Love you, buddy. Oh my God, I have so many questions Maybe. about that. So Robert, we see and are seeing the effects every day of sort of unchecked powers of technology um, and AI being sort of the most salient version of that and it's affecting all of our lives. In what ways do you see Strauss, saying his name correctly, making sure to say that, as both a hero within these themes, but ultimately as a villain, which sadly is now how he is viewed through history. How were you balancing those two I guess, extremes of his personality. It's who, who winds up on the right side of history last. It's, it's, a, it's a weird game. It's kind of like, a, you know, operator, I guess. Um, it was certainly fun to play with. And again, you know, watching, uh, I want to say too, there, the first time I was in the makeup chair, I was about to start working. Emily comes in and goes, Robert, how are you? You're going to love it. It's going to be really hard, but I really feel like, and I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> I think and, uh, you were really cross about what was being done to your hair. I think you were just. I like it. I was like, take more out. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, I, I don't okay. know. That's what that that wasn't the vibe I walked into. You know. She's so <laughs> argumentative. Um, <laughs> And then seeing Killian, he's like, one day you come in and he's just like, what, did you just do 30 scenes? And he just got back and they're all like sand blown in his eyelids. And I was like, hey, you know, last night, he goes, last night I came back to my $18 a night hotel room. And they put my fucking bags in the hallway. I was like, fuck, I haven't checked out yet. I have to sleep. Every indignity that could befall someone who's trying to do something, it was like, it was like the tears of Job. <laughs> Forget the call sheet and the job, it was everything else. It was the most Irish experience I've ever witnessed. <laughs> and it just couldn't happen to a nicer guy. And we're the beneficiaries, by the way. Yes. Robert, did you finish answering my question? I actually don't no. remember. Look, okay. this whole AI, this whole AI thing, it's just like, yeah, I don't want to it's, it's, it's too much. <laughs> Well said, well said. Moving on to the next topic. You were very loving and tolerant, by the way, I want to say that. Hello, yeah. why do you think I was hired to come here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> they know what, what they were putting me into. So Chris has such a magical way of working because it's so an antithetical to what we're used to. The first person script, so different. The fact that he saw this movie as being genreless, it's not a biopic, he said. It's a Western, it's a hero's journey, it's a horror film, it's a love story and a courtroom drama. <laughs> That's a lot to tackle all at once. There is also no CGI in this film. Every effect you see is practical or made in camera. That is staggering, absolutely staggering. And you're also shooting intermittently in black and white and with IMAX cameras. <laughs> so my question for you is, all of these swirling flourishes that Chris brings to the table, how did it free you up as actors to really dig deeply in a way that you hadn't, or just have fun in a way that you normally aren't able to? What about you, Kelly? Um, it was a breakneck pace. Uh, we shot the film in 57 days. Um, so it was outrageously um, fast. But the thing about Chris's films is the amount of prep is just 
kind of mind blowing. I mean, um, I was over and back to LA many, many times uh, after the time he came with the script to the time he began shooting, which is around six months, just testing everything, testing hair and costume makeup and testing with Emily and all the old, old makeup. And, um, and then when you're on set, there is no, uh, you're just working. It's complete focus, complete rigor, complete uh, attention to the work. He expects excellence from everybody, every single crew member. Uh, uh, and people know, know that, They're, it's kind of unspoken. Uh, um, but they, no, nothing ever feels rushed, ever. So no scene ever, ever gets left behind. And when you're in a scene, I think I can speak for all of us, like, that is the most important thing that's happening. And there always appears to be time to go again. If you want to go again, you can always ask Chris, you can go again. And so that is sacred. You know, the, the performances are sacred. And because there's one camera and Chris, there's no video village. So it feels really, really private and intimate. So it does feel like uh, an independent film on, on this vast kind of canvas. Um, but then bang, you're on to the next, you're in like another part of America and then you're shooting again and you're in. So, it's, so it, 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 it feels like once you're on the train, the train has just left the station and you're on it. And that is it. And then you wake up and you're, it's over. Well, that was my experience. <laughs> it sounds very monastic and very on brand for you. And your bags are enough. <laughs> Robert, I'd love for you to talk about the black and white aspect because it really serves not only as time jump marker for the audience, but it totally shifts perspective, totally shifts tone. And your character spends the most time out of it, anyone here in that space. So tell us a little bit about creatively how that pushed you, but also what was fascinating about the way it was executed. I went, uh, I went into Chris's extremely Spartan office at Universal, and there was a picture of Killian that was kind of one of the first reviews with a hat, and then I was like, wow, dude, like, all right, he's clearly arrived in the character, I better find one. And then by the time Chris put a, uh, I think it was a 70 mil test yeah. print on the wall, and then I was there, and then, Sister Bear, and then it was kind of like the story was happening because he was demonstrating it's going to look like this and feel like this and go, wow. You know, um, it's not just the black and white or the size of the camera, it's also stuff where like sometimes you're like, all right, well, let's just do uh, one more. Uh, Nilo, let's get the IMAX out and sing goes, <laughs> Say the fucking words. Um, it's like holding an MRI machine. A hundred percent. I mean, but, it is so, I obviously haven't experienced it, but just watching it, the, the making of, it's this giant box. It's so strange looking. And the fighter would like launch it onto his shoulder yeah. and there's strong people yeah. managing these machines, yeah. But again, I mean, you just feel, I, I felt like I traveled back in time and made a film with you name any of the great filmmakers from the 30s until the 50s or 60s when black and white started going on. It really did feel like that, you know? It was incredible. Um, another fun fact about this movie, there are 79 speaking roles in this film. Yes, isn't that amazing? And I have to imagine it's probably the only film that has a WhatsApp thread called Oppenhomies. <laughs> I'm just guessing, I don't know this for a fact, but finding this out, made me laugh and made me smile. But Emily, I was wondering if you can, I think I got a taste of it earlier about who's bringing levity to the set. But tell me a little bit about balancing the dark maudlin themes, but also having fun. And how are you sort of taking care of yourself? How are you not getting overly mired in the heaviness of this material? Because that is very easily done. I mean, I do think it was easier for Brother Bear over here and I to just like <laughs> pop in and out. Um, I think it was a, a, a Herculean um, effort for Killian every day, and but we had fun. We did. We really did, and like Killian and I did Quiet Place 2 together, so we kind of, oh my we, we go back a bit, you know. <laughs> so it was just wonderful, and we did have a laugh um, when he wasn't in his monastic cell having a bath and <laughs> taking melatonin and going to bed, but, um, but it, it was, there, and Chris actually, even though it's a very focused set and it's private and it's intimate, it's all those things, and Chris is this incredibly authoritative 
guy that I think people are a bit scared of. He has an amazing he's, authority, but also warmth. He's so a so very warm, interesting and combination. Funny, loves a gossip. <laughs> loves it. Like anytime you can share something about someone you've worked with, he's like, "Who? Tell me." You know. Um, <laughs> I knew he had one flaw. He he couldn't be yeah, totally he's, perfect. He's, he's so accessible, actually, and so I. Yes, there will always be scenes that beat the crap out of you a bit and you're tired after them, but I, it was a very joyful experience for me doing it. I love that, which is why you're doing the work, hopefully. And my last question is for each of you, how have these roles, this film, and also working with Chris changed the way you see your abilities as an artist? Has he opened up something in you where you think, oh, I can tell hard stories. I can dig into this sort of unknowable character. I can play like Robert's role. That's a very difficult role to not only dig into and understand the context of that time, but to make him human and make us relate. So tell me about your experience and how you feel like you're changed from this. I'll kick it off. We're all here uh, with our peers. And I think the interesting thing that's happened afterwards is yes, we had this transformative experience. Yes, Chris was at the helm, yes. Killian hosted it and, and carried it, but the rest of us all watched that interplay and, and came in and, and filled in all the color by numbers of it. And it's been transformed, literally changed my life. My life probably needed a little change. Um, <laughs> but it's those things where you have these moments where you go, oh yeah, I can aspire to that. It's not to replicate that, but it's to find that part of myself that would do something really difficult and unlikely to connect, but it's the, it's, it's, it's why we do this, you know? And there's an element of trust too, that Chris saw in you, Robert can do this. I know you can do it, and that must feel good. There's nothing worse than someone trusting you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great problem to have. It's a great yeah. problem to have. And you, I'll just say, you know, the, the paternal thing about him really is that he's like, he's like, you know, every, all of us feel sometimes that every director is a mother or father or they whatever and it often feels like a twisted father and he is a good father yeah. and i think that that is really the main takeaway is when we're when we're surrounded by the proper disposition and the people who have the final say then we can do things even that we don't expect we could do and we can do things that are incredibly difficult we can have great pride in them and the truth is we change through that and then we bring back to our peers, you know, the, the opportunity to keep moving this medium forward. I also have to give credit to Chris. Hold on, hold for applause. <laughs> Robert, Look this one, Alex. You Don't get your applause, we're almost done. But I have to say, Chris has the most incredible group of women he works with, not only his wife and real life partner, Emma Thomas, producer. There are so many craftspeople on this film who are women, and I'm not saying that's super rare, but the level of the women who have worked on this film, production designer. I mean, it's really staggering, and I have to say that changes the tone of the set 100%. So I have to just say, hire more women for these jobs. It's, it's just the right thing to do, and it's just, it just makes everything better. So Emily, back to the original question, how has this experience opened up in you a desire to do something different, maybe aim for different parts, do different work? I mean, I'm not sure I can you know, top this beat that, that, that yeah, absolutely, no, I'm not, I'm not, I really don't. Um, I agree with the safety net that someone like Chris offers you because often, as you guys know, if you're on a project and you might have a leader who has the, the, the egos involved, there's a different agenda, there's a, a lack of a collaborative spirit and I think all of that tightens people up and you, you don't have the wings of freedom, you don't have somebody um, catching you, you know, and I think if you feel that catch and it's as robust as it is on the set with Chris Nolan, I did feel everyone had that ability to take flight and because you have no concerns they're gone, they're gone, and it's just, and he's so curious as to what you might bring. He's a huge fan of what you do, huge you can tell. Huge fan. He's and mystified by yeah, it. Yeah, and he would, because he doesn't have a monitor, so he would often stand by the enormous IMAX camera, or, you know, and he'd just watch you, and he'd watch your face, and watch you in the scene, and 
And he's a big guy, Chris, but you kind of don't notice him anymore. But I, I always found it like really moving that he, he did that. It was cool. And you, sir, close us out. Oh, oh <laughs> um, well, it's hard for me to really try and put it into words. You know, it, 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 um, it's completely mind-blowing, life-changing experience. But it kind of has been working with Chris from the beginning. Uh, you know, it's taught me so, so, so much working with him. And primarily, it's all about the work. It's just the work. It really is. He, that's all he thinks. He about. says he's a craftsman. Well, he you is. can really tell that by watching his work. He doesn't see himself as a Hollywood guy, even a filmmaker. He's a craftsman, 100%. and I think that shows in every frame of this movie specifically. It, it, it really does. And and and, and, he, and you know what? I, what I all, always loved about him is that he he presupposes this level of intelligence in the audience always, and he's not afraid that's to rare. push it. And and he never panders. Uh, to an audience, never talks down to an audience, and that is so refreshing, and and it's been proven with this movie, you know. And then I will say on this particular experience for me, it was to work with the level of actors that I worked with on this film every day was like some sort of uh, setup or like some joke. <laughs> there we go. All right, it was Ken Branham, Gary Oldman, Robert Downey Jr., Emily. Well, it was, like every day you didn't know who was going to walk I, I was, You know, I, I was so tired, I, I wouldn't check the call sheet, and then I'd wake up and go, fuck. You, know, and, and you were pretty much in every frame and everything. Yeah. And yeah. So it was, but then and these guys just came in and they were incredible. And the preparation that they had put into the, the whatever size part it was, and the fo focus, and it was just, you know, you come away buzzing after that. So I'll never experience that again, for sure. Oppenheimer 2? No? No talks of a sequel? <laughs> Too soon? Well, firstly, I want to thank all of you for being here. We're so glad to see actors again. We've, we've missed you. <laughs> and thank you for coming to see this important movie and be spending your Friday night with us. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Yay.